Right, if we can put the slides on. Um, the title of the presentation is uh, Just Hack It, and really I, I want to present you today with uh, some personal experience on how um, I have been facing um, a number of projects, a digital transformation, and the, the tips and tricks that we have found as a team to accelerate them. And I want to give you those, those practical tools and, and maybe take your, your questions after it as well. So starting with the, the problem statement, why accelerating uh, digital transformation? What sort of obstacles I've been facing in the past? Um, this is my, my background. Before I joined Oracle, I come from a, a waste company, a global company called Suez. So it's a company with great engineers and uh, commercial people, probably as a waste company, a little bit behind on the digital front initially, because that's not our specialty. But facing, as many other industries, digital transformation challenges, we had to build in a few years that I was there an e-commerce platform that was new for us, a customer portal, price engines, numerous applications that we had to build in a very short amount of time. But this used to be uh, the process that existed initially when I started on this, uh, working on this challenge, a project uh, management cycle uh, that I found very cumbersome, uh, where we would start with an ideation phase, moving on to requirements, moving on to um, uh, then a build and, and, and finally a delivery. Uh, not only is a process taking uh, perhaps too many stages, but I would find that at each um, point of the, um, of, the pr of the process, I don't necessarily have the information required for the board to make a decision. Because if you look at this diagram, you'll find that I don't have a working prototype to show my customers until very late in the process when I've already invested at least six months of work into building something and conceptualizing it and, and developing a business case for it. Um, so for me, that, that was very backwards, uh, which is why we've tried to find ways to make development cheaper, quicker, so we could present prototypes uh, to our customers earlier. So this is what a typical uh, business case would look like in my head if I looked at the, the possible risk of a project and the possible reward. The truth is, at many um, beginning of the projects, you have no idea. The risk is anything from here to there. The reward is anything from here to there. It's a big gray area to present to a board, um, which is why I, we shifted it and we started working on prototypes instead rather than uh, making up what the, the results would be. The first uh, thing I'd like to share is to start segregating your architecture and your landscape into three tiers. This is a diagram that some of you have probably already seen. I find it very useful. Start differentiating what I call the system of records from what we call the systems of innovation and differentiation. The systems of records are the things that are not yours. They are shared with other companies, your competitors, other industries. They will be your finance system, your CRM. Those are needs that you have that you share with other companies where you don't necessarily need to innovate if you find a good tool. However, the tools of differentiation will be the things that will make you different in the eyes of your customers, in the eyes of your supplier. They will create a unique process. And obviously, innovation is what your employees do that you might not even know that they're doing when they're playing with the data, drawing analysis, probably doing it in Excel, maybe doing it using some shadow IT, uh, but trying to innovate and create new products and most of the time um, can't go anywhere with it. Now, traditionally, in the companies I've worked with, um, there was um, a, a mantra that came coming back in the 2000s, which was, um, we can't be dealing with large integration projects anymore. There was uh, a recurring thought that integration projects was uh, always slowing us down. And what we always try to do is to have an ERP or an operation system that would cover everything from operations to finance, to reporting, to customer portal, because we didn't want to deal with large integration projects. And I think that landscape has now changed. And this is where we can start breaking up uh, the solutions that we use for our system of records from the solutions where we can differentiate ourselves. And so this is uh, the way we, we propose to segregate it. So for those systems of record um, that you share with others, you probably don't need to maintain IP. You're probably happy to get something off the shelf. And you're probably happy to install something that you will keep for a number of years. However, when it comes to your systems of differentiations, then you need to move away from those suppliers. And you can consider taking off the shelf specialist product that will make you different or even better if you can. And if you know how, start building your own custom code. This is how you will differentiate your design, of course. But this is also how you will start building IP that you can maintain. 
And we found that after several years of working with um, existing industry suppliers and developing custom solutions, we were frustrated at then taking it to the market to our competitors when we felt that we had contributed a lot in terms of requirements. So there comes a moment in your journey uh, where you're actually going to start wanting to protect your IP, which is where custom code comes in. And so um, one solution I'd like to propose, and that's my second point, is to work with low code. And I don't know uh, how many of you have heard about what we call low code. It's an extraordinary tool uh, for companies that want to accelerate their digital transformation to um, prototype much faster, to build MVPs much faster, and to uh, escalate them into uh, scalable applications uh, much quicker. There's a few players out there. Um, I've worked for the last few years with a company called Mendix that's part of the Siemens technology stack. Um, I think a very comparable competitor is probably OutSystems. There's a few out there, if you look at the Gartner uh, chart, um, I think the, the two on top are the ones I would recommend for the, the scope of what we are talking about today. And I'll be talking about Mendix uh, specifically that I like working with. This is what coding in Mendix looks like. Instead of working with an HTML page when you're building your front end, you're actually building page with building blocks. So you have, um, instead of text, I suppose, containers and images and uh, pieces of data that you drag and drop. Those blue boxes here on the screen represent the data that I have downloaded to this page that is available for me to show. And I can use that then in my text and so on. And you see the result here. Then uh, a little widget becomes a map. Um, a KPI becomes actually a number that's been measured, calculated from my database. So it's a much more visual way to build my pages. Similarly, I build my uh, data entity model uh, visually as opposed to building a database. So this is an image I can share with my business analyst and my uh, product owners face to face. We don't need to write those requirements too much in detail before. They will see here what are the objects, what are the attributes, and we can discuss these data models at the associations. Is it one to many, many to one? We can have those very visual conversations about the way we structure our data. The same applies to logic. Uh, here is how you would build logic using Mendix. Um, so in this particular instance, to go through an example, I'm looping through a list of anomalies. This is a loop. And I'm changing each of those anomaly. I'm uh, actually um, making them as, as resolved. And then I'm committing these to the database. There's two actions in there. It's very simple. And anybody that has been working on the project understand what this logic is doing. And if it doesn't work, if there's a bug, if we want it differently, it's very easy to change because it's a visual tool. All of this, however, will compile into code. So eventually, you'll get a code package that has been deployed um, on your environment or, or an, on the public cloud that will be translated into Java and JavaScript. However, when you build it, you had, you had this tool at your disposal visually. This is what a REST API would, be, uh, would look like. So you can integ integrate here an example of uh, a call to a Google API to get some geolocation for an address. So you can int include those into your logic as well. Whenever you're facing something where you don't find um, a component existing out of the box using Mendix, you can build your own code. After all, you are building Java code for the server side and JavaScript on the front end. Whenever you want to fall back on this, then you can always put so customized codes in Java, in JavaScript, and CSS, depending on what you're changing. However, you'll find that 95% of the time, you don't need to do that. But uh, this is just to say you, you're not limited. Very quickly, uh, you can deploy it on the cloud, or you can deploy it uh, on-premise. On and what this gives you is a project cycle that is truly agile, where you're building in collaboration with your product owners, and where you are um, executing new projects and prototypes within days, so that you can actually show them to your customers, get some feedback, and then go to the board. And you haven't spent even you know, just a couple weeks of work on it, but you already have some feedback from actual internal and external users on your application before you decide to continue to invest in it. And that's been quite a transformation for us. So if you wanted to um, look at Mendix as a product, I would advise you to go on their website. It's a, a Siemens product, but they have their own uh, company name. It's mendix.com. You'll find a lot of training. Um, there's a free version for people to, to get started and publish your first uh, mobile apps or, or websites. Um, so I, I encourage you all to pick it up. You don't need development skills to get started. A third tool that I will talk about very rapidly that complements the picture I wanted to give today is robotic process automation. 
I won't talk about ev everything with regard to robotic process automation, but explain where for me it fits in that environment when talking about innovation. I find that often enough, we are building applications and we are limited by legacy systems that we cannot integrate to and from, or we are limited by third-party systems that do not have standard APIs. It might be that my process consumes, for example, uh, some prices that come from a website online, and they do not offer a quick way for me to integrate to this data. Whenever I can build uh, APIs and automated integration, then I always should. That's the best way to do it. When I can't, RPA is a formidable tool, I can't say this word, to automate uh, either scraping data from a screen and capturing it and processing it in your system or inputting data in another system. It uses the normal interface as you would enter data in your SAP screen or your Salesforce screen or your whatever legacy application. If it runs on Windows and a human can access it through Windows, you can build an RPA bot, we call them bots, to do the same task but automatically. So to give you an example, if you have a list of leads on an Excel spreadsheet, you can feed that to a bot and you can ask the bot to manually enter those uh, on its own account uh, in your CRM if you do not have a better way to integrate the data. And I find that sometimes, if integration is too difficult or impossible, a way to bridge the gap and not slow down your integration is to start integrating with those other systems using RPA. To finish, I'd like to give you <coughs> three examples of short projects we have worked on in various hackathons and prototypes uh, using this technology stack. The first one is an app that we built, um, me and a team of other three, in 24 hours for a hackathon, a Mendix hackathon that took place in April in uh, Rotterdam. This app, the, the theme was uh, empowering refugees. In, an, in a nutshell, the app was empowering people to create a digital identity so they could prove who they are, store their information in an encrypted way. And in a nutshell, from a technology perspective, we integrated to Microsoft Azure uh, face recognition we integrated to a service for uh, voice authentication, so you could authentify yourself with a voice. We integrated to um, Google Maps for, for the maps, uh, and so on and so forth. Another example is a, a prototype we've built for an insurance customer. The idea was to have an insurance app on a mobile phone where you could toggle on and off your insurance so you could pay it by the minute. So this is just an internal project we've built in a couple weeks with two people as a as a, as a prototype and an exercise to show our customer. Um, so we integrated this with Google Authentication. We integrated this to the Ethereum blockchain um, with, an, app with an, an API that's called Stampery that allows you to uh, stamp data, um, stamp a, a timestamp if you want an event into the blockchain so you can prove that you were insured at this particular time and that your insurance stopped at this particular time and you pay only what you need and we integrated to Stripe for the payments. So you can see that using existing available APIs that are all quite cheap to use, you can build quite advanced solution uh, very quickly. The last example is a real life example. I said my previous company was Suez. Um, one of the Mendix project that we built uh, was this e-commerce uh, portal. If you need to buy waste services, this is a great customer um, e-commerce place to buy uh, bins and, and waste services. Um, you can find your quotes and, 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 and buy your bins in there. It's for uh, businesses. There was no e-commerce before, so we went from zero revenue to half a million just in the first few months. Uh, this is integrated to their Salesforce CRM. This was integrated to their price engine, to their master data engine, and, and their ERP. So there's quite a bit of integration that comes into this. But the whole thing was actually built as an MVP in the first version, going live uh, within six weeks. So you can see the, the speed of that because it would have taken me months and months to convince the board to build that product. But if you can actually bring it to life and just test the market and see how it works, you have a much more compelling case to continue investing in it. So those are the examples and the tips and tricks I wanted to share. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. Any question about RPA, about Mendix, about low code? Was it, auto was, was it automation anywhere or automation everywhere? I, I can't hear you well, but I think the question is, is it automation anywhere? The, the product. The product is called Automation Anywhere. It's, it's one of the leading uh, RPA software. 
There is a community edition. So if you wanted to create a small bot just that you know pushes data in one of your system, if it's in Windows, you can run with uh, automation anywhere. And you can try that for free and deploy it for free on your machine um, uh, as a start. And there's, again, you don't need, I think, a development background to get started with this. There's a lot of training online. Anybody else? Well, in that case, thank you very much for your time today.